You guys know what today is? Huh? Yeah? September 11th, lest we forget. Who in here, by a show of hands, can remember that day where they're at, what they're doing, what it looked like, what it smelled like? Yeah. You just don't forget that, do you? Bright, sunny, Tuesday morning. Things changed forever for us, didn't they? Don't get used to it, folks. The scripture told us, and it's told us it's temporal. A memorial for this day, a reminder. All here? Ethan, you were not alive? Aw. You'll hear the story this morning. Something we should not forget. On September 11th, 2001, 19 militants associated with the Islamic extreme group Al Qaeda hijacked four airplanes and carried out suicide attacks against targets in the United States. Two of the planes were flown into the twin towers of the World Trade Center in New York City. A third plane hit the Pentagon in Arlington, Virginia, just outside Washington, D.C., and the fourth plane crashed in a field in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. Almost 3,000 people were killed during the 9-11 terrorist attacks, which triggered major U.S. initiatives to combat terrorism and to find the presidency of George W. Bush. On September 11th, 2001, at 8.45 a.m., on a clear Tuesday morning, as many of you remember, an American Airlines Boeing 767 loaded with 20,000 gallons of jet fuel crashed into the North Tower of the World Trade Center in New York City. The impact left a gaping, burning hole near the 80th floor of the 110-story skyscraper, instantly killing hundreds of people and trapping hundreds more in higher floors. As the evacuation of the tower and its twin got underway, television cameras broadcast live images of what initially appeared to be a freak accident. Then 18 minutes after the first plane hit, a second Boeing 767, United Airlines Flight 175, appeared out of the sky. It turned sharply toward the World Trade Center and sliced into the South Tower near the 60th floor. The collision caused a massive explosion, that showered burning debris over surrounding buildings and onto the streets below. It immediately became clear that America was under attack. As millions watched the events unfold in New York, American Airlines 777 circled over downtown Washington, D.C. before crashing into the west side of the Pentagon military headquarters at 9.45 a.m. Jet fuel from this Boeing 757 caused a devastating inferno that led to the structural collapse of a portion of the giant concrete building, which is the headquarters of the U.S. Department of Defense. All told, 125 military personnel and civilians were killed in the Pentagon, along with all 64 people aboard that airline. Less than 15 minutes after that terror struck the nerve center of the U.S. military, the horror in New York took a catastrophic turn when the South Tower of the World Trade Center collapsed in a massive cloud of dust and smoke. The structural steel the skyscraper built to withstand excessive winds of 200 miles per hour and a large conventional fire could not withstand the tremendous heat generated by the burning jet fuel. At 10.30 a.m., the north building of the Twin Tower collapsed. Only six people in the World Trade Center towers at the time of their collapse survived. Almost 10,000 others were treated for injuries, many severe. Meanwhile, a, a fourth California-bound plane 
United Flight 93 was hijacked. About 40 minutes after leaving New York Liberty International Airport, New Jersey, because the plane had been delayed and taking off, passengers on board learned of events in New York and Washington via cell phone and air phone calls to the ground. Can you imagine being on that plane? Knowing that the aircraft was not returning to an airport, as the hijackers claimed, a group of passengers and flight attendants planned an insurrection. One of the passengers, Thomas Burnett Jr., told his wife over the phone that I know we're all going to die today. There's three of us who are going to do something about it. I love you, honey. Another passenger, Todd Beamer, was heard saying, are you guys ready? Let's roll. Sandy Bradshaw, flight attendant, called her husband and explained that she was slipped into a gallery and was filling pitchers with boiling water. Her last words to him were, everyone's running to first class. I've got to go. The passengers fought the, the four hijackers and are suspected to have attacked the cockpit with a fire extinguisher. The plane then flipped over and sped toward the ground at upwards of 500 miles per hour, crashing into a rural field near Shanksville in western Pennsylvania at 10.10 10 a.m. All 44 people aboard were killed. Its intended target is not known. The theories include, number one, the White House, the U.S. Capitol, Camp David Presidential Retreat in Maryland, or one of several nuclear power plants along our eastern seaboard. This we must never forget. This we must always remember. And this we must consider the frailty of our existence. Life is but a vapor. Preparation is everything. Knowing who you are and whose you are is everything. Fear will be diminished by truth and facts and the rested assurance of eternal life and a savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs> Father God, we thank you for this morning, Lord. We thank you for the great music that, that we had, Lord, and just a, a, a time of worship and coming close to you, Lord. But Lord, it's September 11th and this country's been through some stuff and Lord, thank you for the reminder, Lord. And, and as we've read those details and many of us recount those news headlines and those stories and boy, what fear gripped the nation. But at the same time, it brought a nation to its knees and a trust and a belief in you, Father God, if only for a moment, everybody understood the goodness of God, if only for a moment. But Lord, today, 21 years later, we understand this. There is no fear and no condemnation in those who love Jesus Christ. Lord, you are our hope. You are our security. For life is fleeting and it's fast. And above all, it's temporal. So, Lord, we thank you. Lord, I ask your blessing on this message this morning. It's one that you laid on my heart, Lord. So I'll just say it's yours because it is. And. All these folks are yours, Lord, because they are. They're made in your perfect image, as your word says. Lord, I hope through this day, through these next few minutes, we'll unpack and, and, and we'll see exactly who we are and you, who you call us to be, what lies before us, not what's behind us, not the past, but what it's going to look like before us. God, would you help us to see that today? We ask all this in the powerful name of Jesus, and his church said, amen. We're going to talk about everything good comes from God, amen? Does anybody know that to be true in their lives? Does anybody, amen? Yeah, come on. Does anybody know that to be true in the last week, in the last day? In the last moments when you got out of bed, 
And those times when life come after you and you hurt and there was loss and you got the word of some tragedy or something that come against you, is it still good? Yeah. That's that underpinning joy that just resides in us. James 1.17 says this, whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from our Father who created all the lights in heaven and he never changed, he never changes and he never cast a shifting shadow. That sounds like something I can depend on. That sounds like something you can depend on. And I want you to focus on that one word. It's a gift. One thing I want you to know about a gift this morning, we don't deserve it. We've done nothing in us, so there's nothing in us that causes God to give us gifts. There's nothing so great about us. It's all about what his son did and what we do with his son. Amen? James 1 17, this verse gives us a pretty good indication of the goodness of God, doesn't it? And how he places these good gifts in our lives. They are good, why? Because they are placed in our lives for his good work and for his purpose and ultimately for his glory, amen? This verse also shows us this, that he is consistent in his giving of gifts, right? They are always good and they are always for us. There are no tricks. There are no smoke screens. There's no, I said I'd give you this, but I'm going to rip it back, and I'm going to give you this thing. No. He always does exceedingly more. He gives good things. Every gift he calls us to possess may look different, but I will guarantee you this, it's good. Don't be confused, and don't be Fooled by shiny things and things that you may think is a gift of God, but on down the road, it just was a distraction. Sometimes his gifts are hard to accept. Sometimes his gift cost us a little bit from ourselves and giving up of our flesh. 2 Corinthians 5, 16 through 21 is our scripture today, is our reading where most of this comes from. I'll have a Some other scriptures, we unpack this, but man, when you dial in on 2 Corinthians 5, 16, 21, Paul is speaking to a church that he established, that he loves, that he cares so much for, but is kind of out of line. There's some folks in there that give more credence to things and possessions. They've been caught up in some idol worship. They've been caught up in... Oh, I would call it settling for things that aren't of God. So let's pick up in 2 Corinthians 5. It's the 16th verse. So we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. How differently we know him now. Come on. You remember how you thought about Jesus when you were in darkness and he didn't reveal himself to you and you thought, oh, probably a good teacher, good guy, you know, and maybe I'll read his book sometime. But man, isn't it something different when you just surrender everything to him? And he's your savior, right? And he's the Lord of your life. Man, that's exciting. I hope you all share that and preach that with folks you love. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has what? Became a new person. It says the old life is gone and a new life's begun. Come on. Old things are gone. Stop hanging on to that stuff in the past. It doesn't own you. It doesn't control you. It doesn't define you. All things are new in Jesus Christ. Live like it, folks. That's what Paul's telling the church. Amen. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself, to Christ. And God has given us this task. Did you hear what I said? And all of this is a gift 
from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ reconciling reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sin against them. Hallelujah. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's, Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. Do you get the picture? Do you understand? This is your call, people. As children of God, this is the call placed on every one of your lives. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through this, through that. Can you believe it? Get up in the morning and look at the mirror, see the countenance of Christ and say, come on, Jesus, who are we going after today? Because he is making his appeal through you. Boy, that'll make you live right if nothing else will. For God was in them and he gave us this wonderful message. So we are, oh, we done read that, come on. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. Guys, you got to read this passage. We speak for Christ, your ambassadors. That means you're a mouthpiece for Christ. And what, what do we say? Come back to God. For God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sins so that we could be made right with God through Christ. You got that verse? Pin it up. He who knew no sin. He knew no sin. He's the perfect sacrifice, the lamb, the son of God. And it says in there that he who knew no sin took all the sin of the world, past, present, future, and put it on himself. Why? So we could become the righteousness of God. What does that mean? That means that you and I could be right with God. Because as I said earlier, we deserve nothing. Salvation is a gift full and free, right? We must accept it. And righteousness makes us right with God. Relationship restored, all things new. So there are three things, as we're talking about gifts, that are essential to understand. Remember, a gift is undeserved. A gift is unmerited. Have you ever been given a gift and just kind of overwhelmed with it, almost embarrassed that you even got it? Too much. How many ever said it's too much? Yeah. Nobody's given me a car yet, but I'm waiting. There are three things that are essential to understand about gifts. First, what's the first thing you must do if you want a gift? You must receive it, accept it. Amen. So you must receive the gift. Second, what's a gift that's not Open. If you have any trouble, open your gift. My grandson, Everett, will help you. He, he stands in waiting whenever there's a package of any kind. And even an Amazon box, he'd be happy to open that for you. So you must open the gift. Okay, so we've received this gift, right? We've opened this gift. Now what do we do? Wait till we get in a part, invited to a party so we can re-gift it? No. Do we, do we put it up somewhere and say, yeah, there might be someday I'll use that? No. The only way you'll get the potential of a gift is if you what? Use a gift. Amen. Gifts that are not received are not gifts at all. Do not neglect the gift. Second, a gift that is never open is a gift never realized. It is simply a missed opportunity. Third, a gift never used or shared is a gift that stops giving, right? It is a gift that is contained and ultimately wasted. So, first we must receive the gift. That's what we'll talk about first. Probably one of the most interesting things to observe when a gift is uh, being given is not so much to watch the receiver, but have you ever watched the giver? Huh? Try that next time you're at a party or, or even Christmas. Fo get your focus off the person's reaction, receiving and opening the gift, and look at the giver. Huh? My dad, bless his heart, 
He was in the middle of the floor every Christmas. He didn't care. The idea of him having a gift he wasn't even his mind. His pleasure was in making sure everybody had a gift and to seeing what they looked like when they opened that gift, right? My dad was Christmas. I mean, that was what he lived for. He loved that so much. I remember another thing my dad did that, that was so inspiring. My mom, when she had her first child, I believe it was 1957, it was the last time she ever turned the key in a car ignition. She never drove a car again. Had six children, raised them with no cell phone, no computer, no network, no car, wasn't in any groups. She loved the church, but that was it. She did fine. But anyways, my dad would hear my mom say a little thing and she'd drop a little hint of something she might want. It could be something small. I remember one of them, her favorite, was, Harry, I'd sure like to have one of those candy bars. You know that bun bar, the one with the maple filling? That's old bun bar, come on. So my dad would just like come up missing. And we'd say, hey, where's dad? Where'd he go? I don't know. And then when he came back to the house, we knew where he went. He went to get mom's maple bun bar. Whether he'd cross the street to the gas station up there on North Main Street, or he'd walk down to the corner to the stop and go, he would always make sure whatever she wanted, uh, she would get. He would get in the car and he would go into town or, or down south, whatever he needed to do to get her whatever she asked for. It was never nothing extravagant, believe me. She wasn't like that. Just these little things. I remember one time we had a little scare. His was convinced his car got stolen. And come to find out, he went on one of those trips to get mom something. He, he drove his uh, Mercury Marquis down to the stop and go, and he checked out, and he walked out the door, and he walked back to the house. <laughs> and he didn't know where his car was. So we had to rescue that situation. But my dad was a giver. And, and if you watch my dad, you saw that on his countenance, on his face, and he just loved it. So, man, what it, would, what, what it would be like if we shut that down and we cut that blessing off and we did not receive the gift, right? Acts 20, 35, Paul reminds the Ephesian elders of the words of Jesus. And what, does, what did Paul tell him? It is more blessed to give than to receive, right? Imagine if we would refuse a gift from the giver. What an awful situation to put them in. What a missed opportunity for the receiver. Why would anyone refuse to receive a gift? Oh, it happens. Sometimes you think about people when you've just shared the gospel with them and you know that it's had some impact on it and, and you're just trying to like push a little bit because you're, you're not getting it, that this gift full and wonderful and free, and it would make their life so much better if they just accept and receive and open and use this gift, and they're not budging. And then it comes to you, because maybe you were there. Maybe they feel a little unworthy. Sometimes when you understand the gift, it's a little hard to believe or understand that that's for you. And so, that could be a situation. Maybe they just don't feel like they need anything from anybody. So, there's also people that don't give a gift because, or have a hard time receiving a gift because they don't feel like they have anything in them to give in return. Think about that. So, maybe we just don't really trust the giver. That's tough. Do you know anybody that you shared the gospel with, you shared Jesus with, and they're just going to go so far with that. It's a trust issue. You know, coming to Christ is one thing. It's a matter of faith, isn't it? Do you know people live such lies, such burden, so many layers, that the thought of putting their faith in something, they can't even get their head around it. 
It's what life does to folks. Matthew 7, 9 through 11 says, You parents, if your children ask for a loaf of bread, do you give them a stone instead? Or if they ask for a fish, do you give them a snake? Ooh, I hope not. Of course not. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask him? He's ready. He's waiting to pour out his gifts on you. Undeserving as we are, he's anticipating because he is the giver and he delights in giving you good gifts. John 20, 19 through 22. That Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. As he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and in his side. They were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. Again, he said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. And then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Think any of them in that room said, no thanks, not for me? No. They received the Holy Spirit. This is a unique picture of the giver insisting that the receiver accept the gift that is a command from Jesus. How many of you know Jesus ain't handing out suggestions today? Come on. Anything he tells you to do in scripture is a command. He's not suggesting things so that you can live your best life now. He's commanding us to be radically changed in his name. Do you know Jesus is a king? Kings command, they don't suggest. Jesus for his disciples to receive this gift of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because he knew they could not, would not be able to conquer hell and the devil without this gift, and neither will you this morning. You're kidding yourself. Pastor Brown told you last week, when you accepted Jesus Christ, you accepted Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Holy the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We're out, our flesh is out, our carnality's out, our little kid attitude's out, our shaking our fist at Jesus is out, and the Holy Ghost of God is in the driver's seat. He knew they would not be able to cast out demons and heal the sick in his name. Just had a text from a brother this week. What does he mean without fasting and prayer this kind of demon won't come out? I said, well, my interpretation, that scripture and everything I studied, in fact, a lot of manuscripts, fast, prayer and fasting isn't even in there, a lot of the originals, but I don't think it was so much about to empower them to remove demons, but it was to change something inside of them. Fasting, prayer, and filling that stuff in us with the presence of the Holy Ghost. They could never be the salt and light they were called to be without the gift and the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit in their lives. Salt does a couple of things. It preserves, right? It preserves truth. And what else does salt do? Makes us thirsty, don't it? Thirsty for life. Thirsty for a water. Thirsty for everlasting water. And then the light exposes the darkness in the world. It exposes us, too, to the people that we must, we must be willing to minister to. So we took care of receive the gift. I hope we're in a good place with that. We're all receiving. Don't ever neglect the gift. Receive the gift and keep your focus on not so much the gift, but the giver. Come on. Jesus is a good giver of gifts. Amen. And now we must open the gift. You guys ready to open? If Everett was here, he'd be ready, wouldn't he, Dad? Amen. We must open the gift to reveal the gift. What? You got your gifts sitting around somewhere? They've never been opened? They've never been revealed to you? Huh. Me and Lisa, we were married in this church, and in this church, in this room, 
I was stand. Oh, there they are, cute couple. I was standing here. She was standing there. I was froze because I was so nervous. And she was laughing just like she is now. She hasn't laughed so much since, but all she did was laugh during that ceremony. I had a thick black mullet. Pretty cool, huh? I could grow a cheesy mustache. So this is the old sanctuary. There's wood up here. Remember, to me, you can see in the corner is the same, wherever it is, communion table. That's the same. Um, but that will be 35 years ago, um, February 20th. So I was just thinking, happy birthday. I was just thinking about weddings 35 years ago versus weddings today. Huh? If somebody gets engaged, say today or maybe yesterday, Jeannie, have you run into Jeannie Headings this morning? Have you run into her? She makes you look at her phone. She's a high tech gal, by the way, 89 years old, high tech all the way. And she says, Look at my granddaughter's hand. Jesse got engaged last night. <laughs> Amen. Jesse and Charlie got engaged to be married. So, 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 and where was I going? Oh, yeah. So, um, so now, I'm not saying this about them, and anyway, I'm just saying in general, because I've, since I've been ordained, I've preached a few weddings and stuff, and how the priorities have shifted. It's just been 35 years. To me, it was like yesterday. Anyways, they're gone. So, somebody gets engaged and. 2022, first thing, tells the parents they're getting married, the people paying for the wedding and all that, that's a bride's family, right? I only had one daughter, I don't know how this all works. Anyways, listen to what I'm about to say, priority of weddings. We better get a venue booked and find a caterer now or we're not going to get one. Number one priority, right? Come on, let's be honest. Come on. There's more emphasis put on the ceremony than there is the marriage. How, how's that working for us? What's our divorce rate? Something else was really unique about weddings back then. The emphasis wasn't on where you was at and what you was eating. There was more emphasis on the ceremony itself. But do you remember how the receptions worked back then? You had three things to eat, one thing to drink, a cake, those little mints that somebody made, they're good, and some nuts. And you drank that punch with that sherbet bobbing around in it. And that was it. There wasn't no six-course meal and a band playing over in the corner. That didn't happen unless, yeah, wealthy people did that. But us commoners, that was our wedding. And your, get, and your guests, they, you had your wedding like uh, between lunch and supper so you didn't have to feed them, right? And, and, and all your people just hung with you all afternoon. What are you going to do? We, don't, we didn't do big dances or nothing. So what are we going to do all that time? I look back at our wedding video. I'm so glad we did it. But at the time, I'm like, we paid that person to videotape our wedding. And all they did was videotape people going through that reception line. They hardly do that anymore. Hey, thank you, Shay. Thanks for being here. Hug and loving on everybody. Do you know how many of those people are gone with the Lord now, 35 years later? And to look at that video just brings me to tears. But you, they're all with Jesus pretty much. So that's good. Then you think about how God's blessed you in those 35 years and the things he's given you and all that. But the biggest thing that happened at that reception, do you guys remember? What was the highlight of the reception? Come on, folks, this is easy. We're talking about gifts. Remember all the gifts that came in and they were wrapped so pretty? You'd feel like a fool if you brought a gift in in a grocery sack with handles on it. That's popular now. You stick some tissue paper in there to make it look fancy. 
Yeah, that's a grocery sack with handles. So, so they would go buy this expensive paper that shined, and they would have these bowls that were beautiful. And remember the table set up where everyone could see all the gifts. Some of you guys are looking at me like Dennis and the rest of you. Don't like this. But I'm going to tell you what. That was a highlight of the wedding reception. I remember our wedding. Everyone's in their place and juggling their cake on their lap and their punch with the floaty stuff, and they're anticipating the opening of the gift, right? They want to see. They're givers. Remember what I said about givers? They're anticipating, and they're looking, and they're watching, and they're excited to see the response that their gift might make. Lisa's grandma, remember they always had somebody there with a tablet and they wrote down who gave what gift and what they gave? Huh? Lisa says, I'm surprised you remembered that. Yeah, I remember. Some of them gifts I think we still have in our house, don't we? Yeah. They were very meaningful gifts. Nice stuff. Especially a couple of kids, you know. It's like, whoa, what are we going to do with this? And 20 years later, we find out what the gift's for. That's a whole nother sermon. Boy, that'll preach. But so, so then this reception went on, and folks were chewing on their mints and crunching their peanuts and watching the gifts be open. Do you imagine how long this took with 145 gifts on a table? Do you imagine? And they were eating it up alive. And we think we have to spend all this money to entertain people and to feed people. Just stop doing it. Get back to the basics. You'll be married for decades. <laughs> Nobody wants me to do their marriage counseling. Oh, well. So, so, there is a perfect example of how important it is to open a gift it, it impacted and it, and it affected the, the guest, the, the givers. It affected the bride and the bridegroom, the receivers. It was a special moment, and that's what we want to see in this transition of the gift. Romans 12, 4 through 8 says this, Just as our bodies have been parts and each part has a special function. So it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body and we all belong to each other. In his grace, God has what? He has given us different what? Gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with much faith as God has given you. If you get to serving others, serve them well. If you are a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it is giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it. And do it gladly. And Christians, as Christians, many of us possess these gifts, don't we? But there are many of us who know we are gifted in a certain area, but we never allow ourselves to open that gift. We never allow ourselves to share the gift. But previous, uh, previous to these verses in verse 12, in, in the 12th chapter, the apostle Paul encourages us to give our bodies, right, to God because of all he has done for us, Let them be a living and a holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. How then can we do this? How do we give ourselves fully and completely to God if we refuse to open the gifts? Guys, we get in the way. We let our circumstances and stuff that is, that is filtered into our lives call out what we should do and what we should be. And he says to re-examine the gift, open the gift, and see what I have blessed you with, and take that thing and implement it in your life. Because my gifts aren't just for you, they're for your spouse, and they're for your children, and they're for your grandchildren, and they're for the people you work with. Pour them out on everybody. Proverbs 18, 16 says, giving a gift can open doors. It gives access. 
two important people. It's the reason we give gifts. John 14, 27 says this, I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart, and the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give, so don't be troubled or afraid. Your alcohol won't get it, your drugs won't get it, your sports won't get it, your television shows won't get it, your riches won't get it, nothing will get it. The peace, the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. Accept this peace today. Open that gift. That'll change everything. We must get ourselves out of the way and allow that we already possess. It's like Pastor talked about last week, and we let that thing just sit there unopened half the time. We also have all these other gifts he just pours out on us, and he's and he's like our daddy, and he's saying, stop chopping down the tree with an ax, kid. I've got a chainsaw right there I gave you, and you won't even use it. And that's where God gets discouraged with us sometimes. 1 Peter 4.10 says this, God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. Do you have the gift of speaking? Then speak through God himself. We're speaking through you as though he were speaking. Energy that God supplies. Then everything you do will bring glory to God through Jesus Christ. All glory and power to him forever and ever. Amen. Can you see the pattern here? He's established his church and his people with great gifts. Great gifts that make your life so much easier. Great gifts that would cause you to be salt and light to a dying world. And we're like, oh, we pay a preacher. He can, yeah, this call you get. I get this. Pastor Brown gets it. Hey, I got so-and-so over my house. I think they're about ready to receive Jesus Christ. You better get over here. What? You have the gift of reconciliation. You are the light of the world. Start acting. Think it's wasted? A gift never used, or maybe a word we could use is a gift never exercised. See, God gives gifts, and we never really implement them in our lives. We have them, but we don't use them. Gifts aren't given to anybody to be set on a shelf and neglected. They're given with the intention that they will be appreciated, and that they'll be used. Second Corinthians, it's, it kind of, um, Second Corinthians 6, 1 through 2, kind of um, should have been hitched on to the end of Second uh, Corinthians chapter 5 that I just read in the opening of this sermon. It says this, As God's partners, we beg you not to accept this marvelous gift of God's kindness and then ignore it. I hope you heard that. Stop accepting these gifts that I give you, my children, and act like as soon as a circumstance comes up, you have to call the doctor, you have to call the specialist, you have to call somebody, and you never once prayed about it, and I gave you the gift of prayer and power as a direct connection to me, hotline. That's what he's saying here. At just the right time, I heard you on the day of salvation, and I helped you. There's a gift. Indeed, the right time is now, he says, for his word says, today is the day of salvation. What are you waiting for? What are you mumbling around? What do you hold on to anyway? Good night. We can go clear back to Genesis and 3 and see all that stuff that the world has was nothing but deception trying to hold on to Eve, he lied to her. It's deception. Why are you holding on to that? It's not of God. You, the scripture says you're created in his perfect image. That means you have the likeness of Christ in you that needs to be revealed and cannot be revealed to accept his son. And when you accept his son, the old is gone and the new has come. 
Does anybody believe that today? That's right. The verses proceeding here that uh, we read in our um, we read in our earlier text is marvelous. This marvelous gift that is the gift of salvation through Christ Jesus. Again, I say it. Can you get your head around this? Sin befell us. We, we're born in this world with inherent sin. We can't help it. You think kids are innocent? The kids that scream in the grocery cart and throw the mom's credit cards all over the floor and demand to have their way? There's an inherent sin planted in there, right? Do you see it? I know they're precious. You don't want to believe that. There is an inherent sin there, even in my grandkids. Oh, Lord, help me. But guess what? He made a way to release us of that. He made us that his perfect image could be revealed in us through salvation. We never see it. We never see it until we allow the refiner to purify us. He burns the dross out. And he pulls it off. And when he looks to the refiner's fire and to this vessel of molten gold with all the dross removed, what does he see? His image. The giver, the maker, God himself sees his image in us. 1 Corinthians 13, 2. If I had to give a prophecy and if I understood all of God's secret plans, and possessed all knowledge. And if I had such faith that I could move mountains, but didn't love others, I would be nothing. Your gifts mean a lot. Be careful with them. Be careful how you use them. Because if you're using them with any of your flesh attached to it, it's not his gift, you done ruined it. You tainted the gift. So he says this and he reminds us throughout scripture. Anything you give in my name, you better give it in love. You understand that? That's right. You better be willing to give it in love. Give it up, but give it up in love. Luke 6, 38 says this, give and you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more, running over and poured into your lap. The amount you give will determine the amount you get back. What are you holding on to, people? There's no reason. You want to get more like Jesus? You want to look a little more like Jesus? You want to be the voice of Jesus? You want to be salt and light? Exercise the gift. I don't know what else to tell you. I know it's hard. Who am I to talk? He gave me the gift. He gave me this gift that I'm exercising in front of you years ago, and I shut it down. I was 54 years old before I went through the ordination process. I knew I was good. My mama, she, she passed in 2005, and for decades before that, she told me, you have a gift, son. He's going to get it out of you one way or another. She never lived to see the day, but he got it. He's got more of me than I thought I had to give him. On my worst day and on my best day. And it is my intention to give of that gift with everything I got. Till the day he takes me home. Romans 12, 6 through 13, and that in his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things. Well, hear this, hear this out of scripture, it just keeps coming up. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If your gift is teacher, teach well. If your gift is encourage, encourage others, be encouraging. If it is giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsible service. And if you have the gift for showing kindness, do it gladly. Don't just pretend. Come, this is the hard part. We're good at this. This is his word. I'm innocent. I didn't write this, he did. Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. What does he mean? You really love your kids? You'll do for them, won't you? You'll put yourself out. You'll cut yourself short to give to them. And this is what he wants you to be for all people. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection. And take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord 
enthusiastically rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. Are you there? That's when you're just like over yourself, over the hold on, and you just start pouring your gifts out. And people all around you are recipients of your good gifts. I want you to bear with me for a minute because I can't even speak this message without speaking of some of these gifts into you. Some of you will hear some gifts all of you have been blessed with, but some of you might hear some things that, oh, I got trouble there. And I think that God wants us to consider, not just receive and open and use our gifts, but he wants us to carefully consider the gifts he's given us. Let's read through some of this. Because of Jesus, the giver of all good and perfect gifts, we have been given the gift of salvation the gift of everlasting eternal life in him, the gift of following Jesus in baptism, dying to ourselves and living anew in him, the gift of holy communion, becoming one with him by partaking of his flesh and his blood, to have the weight of the sacrifice revealed to our hearts. We have the gift of worship, both personal and corporate. Worship is our warfare. We have been given a hope that sees beyond our present circumstances. We have been given a faith that conquers any fear that comes over us. We have been given the gift of forgiveness that has the power and the promise to forgive the unforgivable. We have been given the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit in each of us. We have a heavenly father who knows our name, who we are privileged to call out to in times of despair. We have the gift of fellowship with other believers. We have the gift of our church and our church family alive and essential in our present day. We have the gift of the word of the Bible and the many truths and the promises that it holds. Come on. And we have been given the gift of the Great Commission. Some of you say, oh, that's a heavy gift. I have a, tro- a lot of little trouble with that. We have this gift of the Great Commission with the intentions to go tell the world about him. We have the gift of carrying our cross in his name, never allowing sins that are committed against us to produce sin in us. That is a gift that he gives. Yes, you have to carry your cross. Yes, some people will cross you, and you'll just have to bear that thing. You might have a little burden to walk this life out. He gives you everything you need. He says, Yo, that, yea, though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, fear no evil. He's walking you through it, people. The gift of loving others, the gift to become love so powerful that we will not be hurt. This love, this love will conquer all. In consideration of all these great and wonderful gifts, we must work at our ability to receive, to open, and to use. Anybody challenged on that? Hmm? Something to think about? These gifts, as God intends for us, too, we struggle with this at times because of self. We get in the way, don't we? A little flesh rises up. A little, it might cost me a little bit, rises up. And we struggle with it. So somehow we have done and what has happened to us, we have kind of used that as our barometer and we've withheld the gifts, not dealing with what has happened. Our past is not what he wants us to do, but he wants us to look at our future and who he called us to be and who he sees us. Our perspective on who we are and whose we are has been skewed by the world and it influences. We have allowed the author of lies and and his deceit to muzzle our gift and we've done it too long. No more though, huh? Are you ready to take control? Are you ready to yield yourself that your gift can be fully exercised as he called you to? Huh? The Holy Spirit walking out in faith and becoming all that God has gifted you to be. 
You remember Galatians 5, 22 to 25, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives, and they are what? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. There is no law against these nine things. These are evidence of who you are. These are evidence of that spirit not just contained within you, but that gift open and revealed. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their simple nature to his cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the spirit, let us follow the spirit's leading in every part of our life. Where you at? Have you crucified this stuff? Have you nailed it to the cross? Until you do, you're not going to be able to realize, uh, reveal and realize these gifts in your life and implement them. There are, there are people so confused in this world. I don't know if any of you realized it, but there are so many people confused and in the stupor, they cannot see, they don't have the privilege of knowing. Therefore, they are in the dark and they're destined to a sinner's hell and you are gifted with the gift of life. Huh? Don't you just want to give that? Don't you just want them to be able to receive it, to open it, to use it too? Maybe there's somebody in here, the gifts are just foreign to them. They never accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. Remember that scripture I just read today is the day of salvation? He wants to invite you in. He wants to perfect his image in you. He wants you to see your total potential, for he is your creator. He created you to be more, Right? Today is the day of salvation. He'll meet you. He'll save you. He'll put in you these gifts himself, his Holy Spirit, and his son, Jesus Christ. And you'll never be the same because what? All things become new. New mamas, new daddies, new brothers, sisters, siblings. It's all new. Uh, Mike, can you come up? I'm about ready to close. Um, I'm going to have you strum a little bit. I can't talk about gifts because I love you guys all so much and let you leave without a gift. So I got a gift for you. Don't mind my grocery bag with the handles. Some guy was just preaching about that. There's a whole bunch of gifts in there. Aren't those cute? Little gifts. I'll put some on each side so we don't have a traffic jam up here. And I just want you, as Mike plays softly, I just want you to make your way up to the altar, okay? God sometimes calls us to get up. Man, if we can't move 30 feet for Jesus, are we really exercising our gifts? To stretch your legs, walk up, receive a gift. Now, to get the gift, first you gotta receive the gift, right? Then what are you gonna do with the gift? Open the gift, right? I'm the giver and the receiver. In this gift, you're going to find one word. I don't know what your word is. God gave me 40 of them. Imagine that. 40 words. There's more than 40 packages, so some are repeats, of course. And in those packages is one word. Now you know. But what you don't know. What's your word? What message is he sending you today? This one I just opened happens to be salvation. What has Ed Green done with the gift of salvation in the 50 years that he's been a believer of Christ? What has he done with that gift? That's what's going to challenge me today. You'll get a gift that'll challenge you, I'm sure. But you'll get a gift that you must receive, you must open, and then you must use. So I want you to come up, get a gift, and then I want you to open that gift. You can take it back and open it if you want. You can sit around here and open it. Go to the altar and open it, whatever is comfortable. But if the Holy Spirit of God does something with this gift in you, and you feel like you need to respond today, Today's essential. There may never be another moment in your life like there is today. There never may be another Holy Spirit opportunity to walk into what he's calling you to do. 
There's all kind of words in here. They're all his and they're all gifts and they're all straight out of scripture. Some of them going to hit you like a ton of bricks. Some of them may be meant for a situation that you've just passed through. Or you may be two weeks, two months down the road. And you may see this on your dresser or on your nightstand. And you'll look at that word and you'll say, he knew. He knew where I'd be today. I need that. I guarantee you every word that is in your gift, in your gift box, comes with words and words of scripture. That if you look up any of those words in the back of your Bible, that you'll see tons of scripture. And I encourage you to get in his word. That's how he speaks to his kids. He'll talk to you, yeah. He'll bring healing, but he'll bring challenge. And I pray that you'll decide what you want to, want to do with it. So would you please come, stand up where you are, grab a gift out of the bag. You can run and get your gift, praise the Lord. Don't tell pastor I told you that. Don't tell the security I told you that.